Wellies. I don't mind a bit of slush, Mum. No, it can drizzle a lot in Wales. Go and find your wellies. There's a good girl. And put them in bin bags so that you don't muck up Kate's car. That'll be her now. Will you let her in? Where's your father? Upstairs in his office. Did he vomit? All over the floor. God almighty. I helped him into a chair. We'll get a jug and give him some water. Plenty of water. You can't hold a jug because of his shakes. It slops everywhere. Well, open his mouth and pour it down him. He just sticks it up again. Do it. Hello, Paul. Hello, Kate. Ready to go? Nearly. I left the kids in the car. I don't bring them in. They're a two-man demolition crew. Kate, you're wonderful. I can't thank you enough. Paul, will you go and get my case? I'm going to take this water up to Dad first. Is it one of Daddy's spasms? He's only spewing. How much is he drinking now? Oh, well, it used to be a bottle a day. Scotch? Scotch. But since we joined the EEC, it's more like a litre. Grief. Well, sometimes more. It's every Englishman's duty to go mad metric is his excuse. Oh, that'll be Jill and Tony. Hello. In here, loves. Bye. Jill's going to drive him to the hospital. Well, everything seems to be settled except except David. Don't you think we ought to get a doctor? It's no good. He won't see one. Why not? He's afraid they'll take him in again and dry him out. But why? It's an ideal time. You in hospital for the checkup, the kids with us, and David being detoxified. No go. The answer is never. Greetings. Hello. Hello, love. Hello, Kate. Hello. Hello, Kate. Hello. How are you, Mary? I'm fine. I don't see why I have to go into the hospital again. It's the quack's orders, love. They just want to build you up a bit. The doc reckons you're a bit run down. What with the kids and old Dave, you need a rest for a few days. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Is somebody take my name in vain? I was here to say, oh. Give me a drink, Titanius, ere I die. There. <coughs> oh, that's better. They do all three minutes, I shall lose the oscillation. Ethyl alcohol, C2H5OH, the priceless gift of Dionysus. Morning has broken like the first morning. Breakfast has broken like the first. I'll it all is for God and Mundi and the Lavish Palace, etc. etc. Good morning, President. Hello? 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 The host. The miracle has started. No more, Trevor. There is only a slight delay. The moment or two, even that will pass, and I should be ready to accomplish the very divine morning task. Today, the um, common task. The first thing's first, priorities. Now, this is the day that you're, you're going in, into uh, hospital. the ho hospital, Mary. Correct. And Kate is taking the, uh, the kids to Wales. Also correct. So, what, what time is it? Uh, five past ten. But what time is, is your appointment? Ten thirty. Well, then I'd better get my skates on. Yeah, dress quick for driving you there. Hey, uh... Dave. Dave. What? You're not driving anybody anywhere, not with half a pint of whiskey inside you. Don't talk such rubbish, Jill. Oh, oh I had uh, this, this, this a great. My speech is coherent, and I'm, I'm completely steady on, on my feet. All thanks to a glass full of medicine. David. What? Let Jill take me into the hospital. I'm perfectly all right. You know exactly what will happen. You'll go into the first pub on the way back. You'll hate me to have radiation treatment. You'll want to forget it. Remember? Not forget. A libation, does it? Remember the, the days when we have parties? And you dance. You dance so well. There's no more parties now. No more dancing ever again. You want to get yourself dried out, mate? That's what I was telling Mary. Oh, where were you? Look, it's an ideal opportunity with me and the kids away. I don't like to think of you in this house on your own. Oh, I am not going in that place again. When were you dried out before? I don't know. I don't think in terms of days or years or even centuries come to that. Only eternity. 
five years ago. <laughs> the prison was a, a brick whitewashed prison. All oh, the doctors and nurses as, as a ward is. I mean, they, they would do anything to humiliate you. I've never known such insensitivity. That was five years ago. They've abandoned the old buildings now. There's new methods, new treatments. I mean, the place is more like a holiday camp. Oh, who's kidding who? <laughs> it's true, Dave. Tony and I have just done a feature on it. Oh, are you done? Are you done? You've done a feature? They're so happy and contented there. They actually weep when their time's up and they have to leave the place. <laughs> <laughs> Bollocks! I am maintaining my stable, rational plateau of existence. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Anyway, my chances of recovery are almost nil. That's what one of those illiterate medicos told me when I was in there, and that's highly encouraging, I must say. Oh, those bastards are psychiatric funeral directors. But well, perhaps I'll have it shaven off my pet. I wish you would. I'll kiss your forehead because your mouth's all smelly, Dad. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, son. Bye. 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 Bye, kids. Have a fabulous time. Ten fifteen. If you're not dressed or washed, chum, you have no options. Jill will have to drive Mary to the hospital if she's to be admitted by ten thirty. I'm sorry, my love. I'll let you down again. Do you, um, you still love me? And always shall, my darling. Should be in the hall with my handbag. Uh, we should have you there in no time. It won't take long at this time of the morning. I'll stay. Okay. I thought you were out for the count. A grog, chum, to cleanse the chops. Sure. That's my boy. You know my rule, I never force drink down anybody. You help yourself, I always say. Any soda? What? Soda. There, any agua tapa. <laughs> <laughs> did you uh, <coughs> see the piece I did in the post last week? What do you mean about the lo lonely, mentally defective stable yard mucker out who fell in love with a pony? Yeah. He was only a little chap. He had to stand on a soapbox to do it. God almighty. I mean, how do you write it? I don't know. Well, you love him when you listen. You switch on your nutter like a tape recorder. It's all life. Some's tragedy, some's comedy. It's all life. But you're not talking about the hilarity and the despondency of the moments of living. I mean, you are talking about the entire spectrum. From birth to death. From womb to tomb. From erection to resurrection. <laughs> Good. Um, listen, Dave. I'm a lush, and I know it. I'm an inbuilt generic lush. I'm ovulation to cremation. <laughs> My parents died of drink. Bless their souls. When I was born, after a few slaps on the back, they should have put a breathalyzer in my mouth. I always had the shakes. The panel doctor said that I had an overactive brain. 
at school, I found difficulty in, in, in setting a, a letter or a number down. And then, lo and behold, at the age of 18, I found the cure for my digital tremors. You hit the source? Yeah, yeah, I did. And since then, the intake has progressively increased. Well, over 30 odd years, but of course it's increased. I haven't got anything but control. I once had. Well, I have to stay on the plateau, if you, if you get me. Well, then suddenly it's, it's click, and I'm sent whirling into a, an abyss. Then he's going sweetly and smoothly, and then I just simply fall off the chair and foul myself. And I don't know. I've known that for a long time, mate. It's an occupational hazard. Now listen. Now you think you've got it tough, but you haven't heard the toughest yet. If you don't get yourself dried out and fast, you'll have your kids taken into care. The social workers will assess whether you are capable of raising two kids. Will you cause them fear or anxiety? I mean, you yourself say that you sometimes have blackouts. They don't mind you hitting the sauce as long as the sauce doesn't rebound on the nippers. Keep me in there. A week, ten days. I'll think about it. Think about it quick. Look, I've got to get back to the office. Um, Jill and I will be around about lunchtime to drive you there. If you're willing. David, think of the kids. I'm thinking about them, for Christ's sake! I'm wondering where you are tonight I'm wondering if you are all right I wonder if you think of me and my misery Thank you, Mrs. Purser. Thank you, Doctor. Well, there's nothing wrong with your ticker. Tell you that as a starter. Your lungs are all right. Blood pressure, okay. Mind and spirit, excellent. And the cancer? Straight to the point. I knew you had a good brain. Well? Cancer is just an umbrella term. Cancer of the throat and leukemia are miles apart. The thing that cannot be cured? It's a thing we can try and stop in its tracks. You might as well say anybody who goes to the dentist for a filling has cancer of the tooth. <laughs> You don't mind my saying, Doctor, you haven't exactly got the bedside manner. Well, the old therapeutic gang changed its mind from generation to generation. hundred years ago, I'd have been advising saline baths and leeches. As it is today, I'm advising plenty of rest and plenty of nosh. Now then, here we are. Height five foot four and a half. Weight, seven stone nine. How young are you, Mrs. P? I have 44 years of youth. Then we've got to give it a protein into you. There's no good rely on the prospect of building up your muscles with exercise. Oh, well, I can't twist and shout like I did last summer. Neither can I. Oh, come on, young man like you. I won a swimming championship at 17. I was an also swimmer at 18. I gave up at 19. But at my back, I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. Listen, Mrs. P. You've got years and years of useful life to live. As far as we're concerned, tempest, fog it. Must be very thirsty. I'm unparched. Alcohol dehydrates. <laughs> so I brought you plenty of liquid. You must gulp down plenty of liquid. It'll wash out your liver. Yeah, yeah. I can't hold the glass. Let me give you a hand. It'll, it'll shake all over the place. Let me give you a hand. Oh. 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 He is allowed to smoke, isn't he? Well, certainly, but not in bed. Sitting on the bedside, yes. Um, I'll put a packet in here, uh, together with a lighter. A lighter is much safer than matches. Yeah, that's right, sir. 
And uh, there's a toilet there. In here. <laughs> it was a Mickey Finn you slipped in, wasn't it? I beg your pardon. Non alcoholic, of course. I don't follow. The drink was doped, wasn't it? Ask me any questions and I'll answer except about my job. Go to the doctors about that, they'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> he looks peaceful enough. It was the best we could do. Imagining the beauties of the countryside, slowly eroded ever since the Enclosures Act. Back into that. I was also humming the opening of The Marriage of Figaro, my favourite opera, I might add. You're not allowed up yet. The sister will be round in a minute. Now, drink your tea. Is it doped like your orange juice? Doped? Mm. I don't understand Well, you. according to my silicon chip, I've been out like a light for 43 hours, and that's never happened in my life before. So you can take your cup of tea and shove it on a slow boat to Ceylon. Ah, oh, good morning, David. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Did you have a good sleep? Mmm, comatose. But you feel better. Oh, much. And your name? I'm the sister. I said your name, not your trade. You call me David, so what's your Christian name? Well, I do like to be friendly. I mean, particularly with a pretty young girl like you. We all call each other by our first names in here. Mm. Except for the doctors and I. And me? No, no. You must be called David. Friendliness, as you'll discover, is all part of the therapy. I wasn't talking about my nomenclature. I was talking about the usage of the accusative case of personal pronouns after a preposition. What? What? It, nothing. It doesn't matter. Thank you. Now, your full name is David Purser. Full? I said for them. Well, how about Daniel Timothy David Purser? Well, that sounds uh, rhythmic enough. In fact, he's quite poetic. Dan and Tim in juxtaposition, the unfearing and the fearing conjoined. Yes, I, 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 I'll settle for that. Is that how you were baptised? Well, give me a chance. I've only just invented it. So your real name is David? Yes. And your permanent address is 21 Newgate Drive? Yes, that is correct. Date of birth? Oh, now let me see. The Ides of March, MCM, double X, V, double I, or in the vernacular, 153 apostrophe 27. Religion? I approve, yes. What kind of religion? Uh, lapsed existentialist or existentialist lapsed, what you will. Is that a religion? It can be any religion of your choice. What C of E do? Oh, why not? I'm ecumenical. The sheep will come back to the fold. C of E it is, then? Well, that's all I have time for. Dr. Simpson will be filling in the rest of your report. Thank you, Dave. May I reciprocate the abbreviation? Uh, cheerio, sis. Have you seen David? We phoned early this morning, but he was still asleep. Asleep? They said he should be coming round a bit later. That's a whole day and more, asleep. Oh, it's amazing what a few droplets can do. It makes sense, Mary. He's at the bottle every five minutes. They make sure he isn't for a couple of days. Drying out means drying out. He'll go out of his mind. No, he won't. They've invented an alcohol substitute. It's a powerful drug, but they'll soon wean him from that. He'll be dried out in a week and a bit. Well, thank God for that. Well, dried out, Mary Love, doesn't mean cured. You know he'll be back on the source in no time. Now, for your sake, and for the kid's sake. For his own sake. He must take the full treatment this time. Rehabilitation. Or else he'll be just like he was before. I couldn't stand that. He couldn't stand it. He actually hates drink, you know. Never tries to force it down anybody else. What's this treatment like? Well, um... There are meetings every morning to discuss your problems together. That way you realise you're not so lonely after all. A get-together defies isolation, and self-exile is the greatest ally of alcohol. I know. I live with a lonely lad. Then in the afternoon there are physical jerks. <laughs> and they're mostly teen gays, but you've got to join in whatever your age. Oh, good God. <laughs> it's 
the absolute opposite of the writer's solitary life. For secluded, henceforth read included. Come out of your shell and live the common touch. That should suit Dave's religion right down to the ground. Smile, a kiss, a handshake. Peace, goodwill. We'll be visiting him tonight. Anything to tell him? Tell him... Tell him that he must take the full treatment so that he never drinks again. Otherwise, I don't want to know him. my own thoughts. Are you hungry, Nathan? What? Something to eat? No, I'm not hungry. You must learn to eat. I can't hold a knife and fork. The shake. The shake. Doug! Doug! Yeah, what's up, Jane? 48 hours without eating. Soup! Hey, what would you like, Dave, eh? <laughs> Come on, we've got tomato, chicken, minestrone. Tomato, I think it's a thickness. Yeah, got you, love, eh? And a nice bit of rice pudding to split it all down with, eh? <laughs> Dave, can I put you down for ping-pong? Ping-pong? What, 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 Oh, well, where is this? This is my idea, Gonquin. Or paradise. You're with friends, David. That's all. It's for Dave. Friends. Thank you. 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 Thank just not to get his face in there. He's hidden me altogether. <laughs> Enjoyed it, Dave. That's grub I've had for ages. Not having had anything very much for ages. Yeah, Eddie rolled up. He's gone up in Darry, all right, eh? Maybe he's scraping, slop down. <laughs> Yeah. You're on your way, mate. <laughs> hey, uh, you want a snap, Dave? <coughs> Cheers. <coughs> Thanks. <laughs> See you, Dave. Hey, Doug, I'll have one of those. Yeah, I'll have an interesting linguistic point. I'm feeling Sherlock Holmesish at the moment. I mean, when I say cheers to Doug and, and, and thanks to you, hmm? I mean, they're both terms of gratitude. All right, why do you? Well, because with all your post bieber disguise, my dear, I know that you're a nurse and that Doug's a patient. You've shopped around in Kensington High Street and Doug has slopped around in one of Her Majesty's pokies. Your voice is Windsor, Doug's is Winsor Green. What's your profession? Are you a detective? No, 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 nothing so important. I'm just a, a mass observer, that's all. Mass observer? Mm. Is that a trade? Yes, yes it is, mm. for me. Is uh, David Purser anywhere about here? Oh, he's the Ah, I caught you at last. You should be in bed. This is Miguel. He has some tablets for you. Tablets? Heminevrin. Hemin what? Heminevrin. Heminevrin. It's an alcohol substitute. You won't feel the longings or have any withdrawal symptoms or... Or the shakes. <laughs> Great. The, uh, the palliative without the pleasure. Well, there's, there's, there's uh, progress for you. Have you eaten? Well, yes, Paul's a plastic. He's doing fine, Miguel. Uh, 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 so I them for you. Mm. Some people find them hard to swallow. Oh, si vale. Jane, you are eating us un polvo. Conio, hablas el castellano? No, me hacen con. Poder madre de Dios. 
Polvo, abra. <laughs> What's all that about? Polvo in Spanish means uh, a powder or, or a dust. In, 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 on the Castilian plain, there are no woods where a, a boy might take his girl, only uh, hidden hollows in the sand, and there the lovelings make a powdered dust or polvo. Bien explicado, hombre. Salud. Salud. Hasta luego. Adios. Adios. Do you know, I thought you were a tramp. Dirty, unshaven, no clothes. But, but I am a tramp. I mean, how else could I speak uh, Castellano to Miguel? Brummy to Doug and uh, received English to you, my dear Jane. Taught for years at... Uh, that, oh, but my crystal ball is still functioning. All right, uh, it wasn't Rodine. Uh, Cheltenham Ladies College. Nine out of ten, it was Malvern. How'd you do it? I'm a professional mass observer. I'm, I'm a professional tramp. That's all. Well, I think that about completes the official bit. Is there anything you'd like us to chat about? Mm, when were you appointed here? Oh, about four years ago now. Do you mind if I smoke? No, not at all. But you don't, of course. Well, from the little I've seen, you made a seventh heaven. My heartiest congratulations. I mean, never have I witnessed such euphoria. Don't flatter me. I wasn't. I'm not alone in a new approach to a growing problem. It's really quite simple. If people can feel sincere friendship to one another, personal dignity, no worries about security, escape greed, and all this in a warm, pleasant environment, there'd be no need for so many hip flasks or hidden bottles. And when they re return to the outside world? Many will fail, but some, a few, will improve the outside world. How long is the course? I mean, the full uh, renovation? Usually 10 to 12 days of dry now, plus six weeks of rehabilitation. When I was in here last, when it was five months, I mean, at least. In our economic climate, there have been cutbacks in public services, Mr. Purser, as you well know. I suppose you could say, in a way, we've taken advantage of it. How? During the last five years, index-related, this unit has cut the cost of patients per capita per annum by 42%. Mm. Half the treatment and you halve the costs. Overheads remaining. More than half of them have been ploughed back into the amenities that you see around you. The nurses, for example, have been given grants for civilian clothes. Mm. So I've observed, Doctor. Our success rate stood at 14.3 five years ago. It's now 44.8. Based on what? The patient's non-return to our unit within 12 months. Yeah. Yes, I know. Statistics can be misleading. Don't you um, have clients who, who can't stand the world of today and just get themselves dead drunk to gain entrance to your protection? Yes, of course we do. Prisons have a similar problem with the recidivists. Exactly. It's a problem that we've got to overcome. Well, now, Doctor, I mean, tell, tell me about your, uh, your fresh curriculum. Well, it varies according to the patient's need, but as I've already said, it's uh, 10 to 12 days of drying out. Uh, using heminevrin to replace alcohol? And to combat the unpleasant side effects. Side e What's side effect? The shock of total removal could cause fits or spasms, but these last about two days usually, and at the same time we encourage you to take regular meals, be neat and tidy and sociable. So, day 10? Rest, examination, making sure you're in reasonable health. And that's all? That's all. You've been dried out. The, um, the process used to be three weeks with daily paralytic injections in your bum. Was that an encouragement or punishment, was it? Those days have passed, Mr. Purser. Electroconvulsive therapy. Now, look, I've been tinkering with my brain. I live by my brain. No, ECT. Previously, we mixed alcoholics with psychotics, not now. No, now I'm, I'm in a room with three empty beds. In, in your so-called common room, I, mean, there are, there, there, I approximate there are a thousand patients. I mean, how? Simple. You're merely being dried out. They've joined the six-week course. How many men to women? 
Well, the full complement, ten men, six women. Do any of them have love affairs? Some do. Many are driven here by loneliness. Why not? Why not, indeed? Well, I, I mustn't waste any more of your valuable time, Doctor. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Percy. Uh, yes, sir, Doctor. In all this official form-filling, which I usually write in a rush doctor's hand of hieroglyphics so that no one can read it, in fact, I'm often hard put to decipher it myself. <laughs> Which only proves what a busy man you are, Doctor. Dear me, do you know all the secrets? Most of them, yeah. Uh, given the question, any previous convictions regarding alcohol, you replied drunk and disorderly twice. Uh, correct. The police asked silly questions, so I gave them silly answers. But the police do not like silly answers. Well, I merely raised the point to discover if you are aggressive. <laughs> yes. When the, the mood takes me... In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, I am not, not worthy, worthy to receive, receive thee, but, but only, only say, say the, the word, word and, and I shall be healed. healed. The body of Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Let us abide in God's peace. Cigarette, Mary? Oh, no, not in here. It's the oxygen. God help us. Another cross to bear. Let's have a quick one before the sister gets back. <laughs> you have me shot. So David's been dried out again, is he? That time, too. Will you let me say a prayer for him? He needs all the help he can get. Thank you, Father. You know, there's a question regarding David that's always puzzled me. Oh, yes. Why in the name of creation did he choose to become a Catholic when people and priests alike are leaving the church in droves? He said, they've opted to believe in nothing. I shall opt to believe in something. In 2,000 years of this philosophy will suit me. Like nothing else, it stood the test of time. And then he converted you? Not directly. Not with the slightest attempt to proselytize. He doesn't like people to know he's a Catholic. He thinks his colleagues will find it fuddy-duddy and bad for trade. <laughs> he's not a missionary. Merely a man challenged to opinions by blank paper. And the kids? Oh, never a word to them. On Sunday, he drives to 8 o'clock mass. He's back before they get up. Don't preach it, live it, he says, and then they'll know. Oh, God. I hope Jill and Tony don't carry out my instructions too literally. And what are those, Mary? If he drinks again, I never want to see him. But it's not true. I love him. If you don't take the full course, and never drink again. It's a breakup. She dismisses me. Yes. And tell her that I accept the dismissal. I've never known such treachery. My dotage of her has been luxurious, and luxuriously I give way. You can tell her that she can do what the hell she likes! Was anybody shouting? Yes, I was! I have visitors who are hard of hearing. We must make allowances for the handicapped deaf, must we not? Like, please, kindly just leave us in peace, Tommy. Certainly, Dave. We were quite sure that Mary said she would never have me back if I were to drink again. And those were her actual words. Well, that's what she said. But Mary is, is asking the impossible. 44.3 is the success rate, so the doc told me this afternoon. That's not bad going, but I never gamble when it's odds on. I would be dishonest to give her such a guarantee. But there's something deeper. Much deeper. What is it, Dave? At this satirical tag end of our occidental culture, as the sun declineth in the west, an existentialist named Sartre, whom I worshipped in my youth, turned Marxist. Au revoir, I became Christian and I've never regretted a day of it. We know you've turned into a left footer, David. So has we... my wife. She followed me not by preaching, but by practice. She loves you, David. Oh, does she? Or am I simply her meal ticket? Oh, for Christ's sake. I, I wanted a nuptial mass, a real marriage this time. The priest said that ever since 
Vatican II, such a thing would be irregular, a reconfirmation of all that was in our hearts at the registrar's office was all that was necessary. So, so we swore round the kitchen table to love, to cherish, in sickness and in health. That's the old garlic bit. What amazes me is, is, is Mary's unilateral action. Unilateral? Well, for sure it's unilateral. It's, it's, it's a violation of a Christian marriage. We're both cripples. She's cancerous, I'm alcoholic. I mean, who goes first? She's just a moot point. Dave, you've got to stop thinking that way. What way? Should anything happen to Mary? Should, should, should anything happen indeed? Look, there is my girl for the insurance company. Should anything happen? I mean, you mean death. Death? Yes, death. The lady's interest in life is death. I once thought that we were one flesh, but no more. You can tell her there would be no recrimination. Financially, once that was all ours, is now entirely hers. I'm, I'm just a trifle disappointed, that's all. Anything else? Yes. There's a key under an oil can in the garage. Now, bring me some clothes. A pinstripe would do ele excellently. I must look elegant for the operation in hand. The woman I'm hurt. I mean, really hurt. Victims have to be found. Well, a little nutter cracking would suit me at the moment. Not the patients. What, the Lonely Hearts Club band? <laughs> no, no, not them. No, my sights are higher than that. Good morning, Mr. Purser. Mr. Purser. <laughs> Sorry, madam. I didn't know you were there. How can I help you? The women's ward is on the other side of the corridor. They make you very comfortable. It's like home from home. Excuse me, you've got a little smudge on your forehead. I am Dr. Garavandi, your psychiatrist. <laughs> My psychiatrist? I am your psychiatrist, allotted to you. Uh, uh, which school? I beg your pardon. Also, we can uh, talk a common twang regarding my psyche. I mean, are you Freudian, Jungian, Langian, or just uh, simply pills? I am university trained and medically qualified psychiatrist. Oh, from India? Yes. <laughs> uh, taught by some guru? He was a DPM of the University of Calcutta. <laughs> no doubt about that. What will our National Health Service in what next? I mean, how poverty-stricken can a nation get? What? Oh, doctor, you lost your smile. Please put it back on again. It rather suits you. Are you saying you object to me because of my race? No, not the least. I've always looked upon the Indians as sunshine people. I hope one day that we all intermarry and become of one golden colour, or be at or bay as His Holiness desires. But as of this moment, your ethos is not my ethos, and that's that. Mr. Purser, mm. I think it possible that your mind is extremely sick. Well, then you're a psychiatrist. Cure it! You say things that are quite incomprehensible. In my day, a mere third former would comprehend me. I mean, our education has turned awry. Our sums we did in our heads. Now we push buttons on calculators. And as sure as God made little apples, the spoken word will become technological next. The medics will have our tongues removed as unnecessary organs. Do you know, I, I sometimes weep for our next generation. But, oh, but let's, uh, let's talk of immediate things first, shall we? Okay, Mr. Purser. Now, let us discuss your present situation. Forgive me if I overreacted to what I took to be your aggression. The overreaction, dear madam, was like Newton's celebrated third law. Equal and opposite. Thank you. Now, can I suggest something? Please do. Instead of locking yourself away in here, mix with the other patients. Relate to them. Laugh a little. I have little to laugh at at the moment. My wife is possibly dying of cancer, and it seems that she has taken leave of her senses. I have heard about your wife's case. I agree, her situation is tragic. But you try to think of yourself. You are still a young man if you wish to be. You can always remarry. Look, would, would you kindly just piss off? back to the Indian subcontinent and give them the benefit of your trick cyclist mumbo jumbo your bloody patronizing advice all this will be reported to Dr. Simpson just yes, piss off piss off I never come near me again
Mr. Purser. Doctor. Do you realize during the last week you've antagonized almost every member of my staff? You amaze me. Almost half of today's meeting was taken up discussing you. Oh, surely I can't be more that important. My psychiatrist tells me that you have an obsessive fear of the female sex, combined with an almost paranoid dislike of races other than your own. And I suggest that your psychiatrist is in urgent need of a psychiatrist. You told the night nurse that he was lazy and irresponsible. I told him that, um, compared with the, well, let's see you, doctor, that he was uh, overworked and underpaid. Now, that is offensive both to him and to me. No, not if we examine the circumstances. I work throughout the night, because once I start a scene, I must have no interruptions to spoil the emotional continuity, otherwise it's cut and start again. The other night, a drunken Irishman was carried in. He was stripped and placed in the bed facing mine. I tried to continue working, but for an hour, he kept yelling, NURSE! NURSE! No nurse came. His cries became desperate. I then visited my sad, sick brother, and I said, I am your nurse. He tried to pull back the bedclothes while plaintively asking, they won't put me in solitary for this woman. Solitary? There was excrement baked all over him. Hard, dry, stuck to his flesh. He could have been there for days or weeks. It couldn't be peeled away without taking with it his skin, and still he was pissing. And shitting, I also shouted, nurse, nurse, but no nurse arrived. I then did what I considered to be my Christian duty. With two bed covers, I dragged the poor sod to a shower. With the aid of hot water, soap, both my hands, fingers and nails, I removed all the shit from him. With the bed covers, I dried him and assured him that would be no solitary while I was about. I then dragged him back to a clean bed and removed all the foul linen and dirty bedclothes and put them in a heap. I then returned to my writing, thinking that as a good boy scout that I'd done my duty for the day. And where was my lazy and irresponsible night nurse? I empathise with his peasant mentality. When in a tight corner he thinks that attack is the best line of defence. So where was he? Asleep. Sleep? Mm, comatose. I, I, I don't know if you're aware of it, Doctor, but in Spain it is common to do two jobs of work in your 24 hours. In daylight, your night nurse works for a scrap metal dealer. He then washes and works for you. At a pittance, I might say. He has five children and an invalid wife. I admire his courage. A man does need a kip sometimes. The sister has a lot to say. It seems that you told her she was wasting her time here, that she'd be better employed running a psychiatric unit in the Soviet Union. <laughs> Teachers! Well reported, I confirm every word of them. You insulted a guest speaker from Alcoholics Anonymous. Insulted? I do watch your language, Doctor. I'm glad for your sake that there are no witnesses, otherwise your language could become slander. So look, I insult. No one. What happened? Come in. Please. Sit down. The burden of the gentleman's song was that an alcoholic was perverse, destructive, cruel and harmful. I merely reminded him that such quirks of human behaviour are not the prerogative of alcoholics alone. Neville Chamberlain, who by all appearances could have got drunk on a half a pint of shandy, committed one of the most treacherous acts in British history. He had Benish and Masaryk incarcerated in some Munich hotel by the Nazis while he gave their country to Adolf Hitler on a plate. Chamberlain's successor, Winston Churchill, a strong whiskey addict, using poetic language, stirred this nation and others to such a pitch that he put the monster down. <laughs> Although I'm a radical, I thank God for the soaked, whiskey-driven Churchill. That's what I told the AA. Why did you tell my nurse Jane she was a snob? I did nothing of the sort. 
I merely observed from your duty at Rota, Doctor, that her appellative was Lady Jane Charingforth Brown. I couldn't see why she isn't simply nominated as Miss or Mrs. Brown, like the rest of the nurses, unless in this oasis of parity it is intended as propaganda to impress your governor. So oh, yes, I've saved the best of my cordiality, good cheer, and paliness for the top doc. Me. Yes, you. I believe your Christian name is James. It is. Go on, Dave. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. Now let's study this room. Three walls are painted in Wedgwood blue, and the moulding of the cornice surmounting the frieze has been delicately picked out in a celestial hue, similarly with the moulding on the ceiling where once held a crystal chandelier. I mean, such. Elegance and grace would charm even Dr. Samuel Johnson, bless his soul. But to add Pelion on Ossa, the fourth wall behind your back and in front of your patient's eyes, I mean, could be Elysium itself. The glory and the freshness of a dream. The azure of the heavens is, is dotted with golden stars. I saw eternity the other night, like a great ring of pure and endless light, all calm as it was bright. Now, 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 let us just think about the poor, pathetic, drunken charges in your most beneficent hands. The decor, it lulls most of them into a sweet ease of mind that they've never known in their lives before. And once again, my heartiest congratulations. Look, David, I know that we haven't got everything quite right yet. <laughs> That's the basic human failure. It's sometimes known as original sin. Would you grant me the privilege of showing you further how your excellent intentions are not exactly conducive to mental health? Please do. Right, come on, in! Hey! Come on! Right, no, no offsides! No offsides! I'd say, Doctor, in my most congratulatory oh, tour, we found the men's wall. Men's wall be decorated with a wallpaper of pink roses. Oh, I thought it rather tasteful yourself. Mm. You are old, David Purser, the young man said. You write in the night out of spite, incessantly standing upon your head. You think at your age it is right. In my youth, David Purser replied to his son, I feared it might injure my brain, but now I'm perfectly sure I have none. I do it again and again. But when we were talking about pink roses decorating the men's ward, being an ardent feminist myself, I wonder if it's your purpose to denacrum. What? Well, let's think of the wonderful strides your most noble trade has taken in the last couple of decades. The pill, vasectomy, safe abortions, human AI, heart transplants, germ warfare, defoliation, polythene inserted into a drooping breast, thalidomide, to name but a few. I mean, if Hippocrates were living at this hour, he would not know his ass from his elbow. <laughs> your next step will be self-pollination. Mm. Oh, I mean, don't tell me that your profession hasn't thought about it. There's no need for male and female. Like some fruit trees, you simply fertilise yourselves. If I would terms, pleasant, self-productive masturbation. Hence, your men's ward is decorated as a woman's boudoir, being a primary step towards your final end. What's wrong with this room, then? Wrong? Well, there's nothing wrong. I mean, it's ideal, if you like living in a cage. Well, that's an interesting observation. Why? Well, beneath your sublime lies your subliminal. Now, here we have a room, like the majority of rooms. It has four walls, one floor, one ceiling. The ceiling has ceiling tiles, nine inches square, attractive, but enmeshed. No escape. The floor has linoleum tiles of a curious design. Squares within squares. No escape. One wall has panelled or compartmentalised windows, a remnant of the original building. No escape. Two walls of attractive, cheerful, modern wallpaper. But look again and you'll see that it is based on a trellis or grill-like pattern. Again, no escape. But let us turn our heads and examine the fourth wall. It is completely plain and painted in a yellow or sunshine colour. There lies every escape. Yet see how your patients have lined your uniform armchairs against it. 
Look at the room again. You will observe how the deployment of the furniture, whenever possible, avoids witnessing that wall, for that wall spells danger. It demands freedom, independent thought, personal integrity, moral strength, and truth. No wonder they turn their backs on it when life on the outside, for them, is solitary, lonely, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Hmm. Mrs. Mary Purser, is it? Yes. I'm Louise Day, social worker. Oh, hello. How are you feeling? I'm rested. Completely rested. That's good. How are things at home? Oh, fine. I'm lucky I've got good neighbours. They've taken the children to Wales on holiday with them. That'll be Paul and Lucy. How do you know their names? I looked at your records on admission. Lucy, that's a pretty name. Yes, well, my grandmother's name was Lucy. And my husband adores the Beggar's Opera, so there you are. Lucy Lockett? <laughs> He's a nice guy. But with a topsy-turvy mind like the opera itself. The goodies are the baddies. Only the blind can see. The teachers need to be taught. Probation officers should be put on probation. Gynecologists are women haters. And all the best telephonists wear deaf aids. <laughs> His paradoxes are endless. He somehow connects them with Christianity. The richer are the poorer, you lose yourself to find yourself. Only the meek shall inherit the earth. Oh, sometimes he's right. He said that psalm-sucking Nixon is a crook, but what's worse, he's an incompetent crook. And that was long before Watergate. Is he a practicing Christian? Fervent would be the word. Is he at home now? Actually, while the family's away, typical of his kindness, he's taking the opportunity to be dried out again. He drinks, you see. The Hedges Hospital. Hmm. Another of his paradoxes. In this mad world, to be alcoholic is to be sober. And to be sober is to be drunk. <laughs> Packing. Are you leaving? Mm. Why? I've made too many enemies. I even attacked you, my pretty one. If I stay in this prison any longer, they'll start treating me as a, as a child killer. I'm sorry, I apologise for any hurts. Do you remember what you said to me when we first met? When I'm drugged or drunk, there's little I can remember. You called me my dearest Miranda, a thread of mine own thoughts. I've looked it up. I know what Miranda means. Well, in Spain, they have Mirandos or Mirados. They're signposted, indicating that there's something very special to look on. A Miranda lies in your eyes. Our revels now are ended. In our Amiga lies our Alpha. Eternally. Come on, let me give you a hand with this. Come in. Ah, oh, Mr. Purser. May I join? Please, do. You've changed your room, around. Right? Upon your recommendations, yes. Mine? I want to know what it's like for a patient sitting here. What I once thought gave tranquility can just dazzle the mind. Well, I, I apologize for any insulting remarks. Oh, you were enlightening. In fact, I am at the moment preparing a report to the board upon your many positive criticisms. Well, much was said out of destructive spite. I know, but as your much-hated Neville Chamberlain quoted on his return from Munich, out of the nettle danger, we pluck this flower safety. So? Oh, in my job, you find that in 99% of the cases, people at their roots have tried to pursue the good as they see it, but they find it's a mistaken good. And in their disappointment, they give up in life or they try to sustain life with its many duties and stresses with alcohol. Are you saying that mostly the good get drunk? They take too much to heart and too much to mouth? The mistaken good. But the chemical C2H5OH overtakes them. They find that they're living in a fool's paradise. 
The trouble is it becomes not paradise regained. It's got to be topped up. I'm sorry that I cannot take advantage of your rehabilitation course. There is an atmosphere of benevolence, kindness and uh, fellow feeling within these walls that can really be found elsewhere. Any um, caustic remarks that I've made pertain to my trade. In heaven, there's no drama, nor any possibility of drama. Drama depends upon conflict and failure. My trade is a scrutiny of hell. For any proud dramatist, his style is his prejudice. You're leaving? Yes. Please don't. Why not? Well, to start with, you'll most likely have fits. Fits? Stay a few days longer, I beg you. Well, no, no, what do you mean by fits? I mean epilepsy. I, I've done my, my stint of drying out ten days. I mean, in fact, it is now day 11. So, so what do you mean by, by fits? You're still taking the tablets. They're in every and you should be off them by now. But you're not one of my usual patients. You've been on the hard stuff for some 30 years. Look, let's put it another way. In Paddington, London, there's an alcoholic unit with 130 patients, and the oldest of them is age 14. Oh, my God. I take a point. Before I can cut you off from Hem and Everin, I've got to switch you to other drugs so that your metabolism doesn't take too much of a jolt. Fits. Fits. I'll take the risk. Leave? Uh, please understand, Doctor, that I'm a freelance writer where unemployment is around ten times the national average. I mean, I can't get unemployment pay because there is none for the self-employed. I mean, I'm no different from the almost extinct backstreet grocer. And what do we have instead? The supermarket. Instead of personal service, it's help yourself with an electronic till and a warning. Thieves will be prosecuted. And most of your other patients can contain that, that broiler chicken world. I, I, I can't. I sympathise, but you put me in a hell of a predicament. How? There's a possibility you'll have fits. You could be crossing a road, collapse, be killed by a car. Y your predicament? I ought to take out an order for your detention. Committee. For the safety of both of us. After all, I've prescribed the drugs. I don't want to appear before a coroner's court. You know, if you did that, I should lose my wife? my family and my livelihood. Oh, but I shall have nothing to live for then. Understood. So, I've got another suggestion to make. I drive you home. You? Oh, why not? You only live about six miles away from here. You? My, but my doctor, my chauffeur. Oh, I've got another unit to visit at Worsley. In any case, it's only about half a mile out of my way. Which is kindliness itself. Now, I can only manage this on one condition, that I get in touch with your local GP and inform him of the possible side effects and suggest future medication. If he agrees, you'll be back with your family doctor. And I sincerely hope in time, with your family. I've been chasing after you all morning, Mr. Purser. That's, um, flattering. Why flattering? Beauty pursues the beast. You have absconded from an alcoholic unit, refusing the full treatment. Who told you that? The sister. I've just come from there. She also told me a few things about your behaviour while you were inside. What things? Your antisocial attitude, your unwillingness to fit in, your lack of respect for others, your stubborn pig-headedness. In short, are you a person we should let loose in our community? So? Are you aware your wife has secondary cancer? No. Yes. What does that mean? I wasn't. You've just told me. Before, no. Now, yes. 
And you realize that by refusing the full treatment at the alcoholic unit, you are placing yourself in a very precarious position. How? You do love your children. Correct. Then they may have to be taken into care. Have you ever been convicted of any offenses regarding alcohol? Yes. Would you care to tell me the nature of the offences? It's drunk and disorderly, twice. It's more serious than I thought. If your wife becomes permanently incapacitated and you are upon record as being drunk and disorderly whilst refusing full medical attention, then we shall have to take care of your children. If you love your children as you say you do, then you must swallow a little pride and have them handed over to us. We shall look after them for you. It's the children we must think about. I've been thinking about them. Where are they now? They're in some remote part of Wales. They're with good and friendly neighbours. It'll be a week before they return, so you can't take them away from me at the moment. They are, as it were, already in care. For a week? Much can be done in a week. How's my wife? Rested. Happy. Relaxed. Good. I made it a rule in my life never to strike my children, and never have I done. Physical violence only breeds physical violence. But there are plenty of battered nippers around for your attention. But if you're looking for them here, you're just simply wasting your time and my time. It's your official record that counts against you, Mr. Purser. It really is an irony, isn't it? If I hadn't volunteered to be dried out for the sake of my wife and my children, everything would be all right. But as I chose to and told the truth at the same time, everything is all wrong. And as for official, I could certainly tear some strips off that. In one country, birching is official. In a, another country, the electric chair is official. Garrotting is official. Total abstinence is official. The, the, the severing of thieves' hands is official. Drive on the left is official. Drive on the right is official. Yet all these countries belong to the United Nations. It's curious, isn't it? I'll tell you what official means. It means Jack in office. And that's all. Yes, well, I shall have to report on all these matters and be back in a few days. I shall welcome your return. Any person or persons who show such a warmth and interest in the welfare of my family will always have a, a place in my heart. Don't bother to get up. I can find my own way out. David. When did they let you out? This morning. How do you feel? Blooming. Blooming. And you? Oh, sound is about fighting fit. Was it very dreadful? No. Quite the contrary. Heaven on earth. Garden of Eden. Paradise. If goodwill and gentleness. I'd certainly recommend it to any alcoholic. Then why didn't you stay on for the rehabilitation? For eight weeks is a long time for any freelance. When you come down to it, all the self-employed sell is time. And my message through Jill and Tony didn't help matters. That's all settled now. And I can't promise not to turn to drink again. But I can promise that we and the kids will live under one roof with the safeguard that they shall never be taken into care. How? Well, somebody once asked me, how many rooms do you have? Well, my answer was I simply didn't know, you know, should you include the old servants' quarters? I've redesigned the house. The builders start next week. We shall stay as a family unit, plus a housekeeper. 
housekeeper. Mm, who will be paid handsomely for taking care of you and the kids. Where are you going to find the money? Well, easily. Do you remember when we got married 22 years ago, we couldn't afford modern furniture. So we had to resort to what you can glean from the old junk shops. Uh, horsehair, Chesterfield, leather here, papier-mâché there, inlaid cabinets, bow-fronted dresses, early Victorian, well, sometimes Georgian. But we couldn't afford wallpaper, so we had to use whitewash. The result was so glaring that we were back again in the old junk shops for antediluvian oil paintings. What cost then a few bobbies is now worth I mean, a few thousands. A little flogging now and then at the auction rooms and... We'll get by. I promise. I do love you, you know. Without that love, I'd throw away anything remaining of my survival kit. I, I popped into a, a shop in the high street and I bought two little boxes. One for you, one for me. Eternity rings. <laughs> the rich will be. I put one on your finger if I'm honoured by you putting one on mine. We'll, we'll adjust for size later. It's my first one to take 